Carrie? Carrie. Okay. You got it. Okay. All right. Just, 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 yeah. I just have to make sure I remember these things. <laughs> All right, guys, welcome back to KB Reptiles. I am beyond excited. Yes, the Canadians made the trip. We are here at Nerd. Kevin, thank you very much for having us. There. <laughs> <laughs> so we did this thing with Kevin at Tinley to try to remember my name because, as some of you know, it's not the easiest. So we did the grizzly bear with the red rose, and it gives you That's bear not rose. what he said. He says, <laughs> after a bear does something to you, <laughs> red rose. That, he told me something way more edgy. <laughs> so Kevin, again, thank you for having us here. Uh, I want to do something a little bit different. Um, instead of talking about current day, everyday stuff that people might already know about you by watching your videos, I want to go back a little bit and talk about, I'll ask the first question right off the bat. How, when did it start for you? At what age did you decide, I want to start working with reptiles? Well, <laughs> I started when I was like a little kid and I was like, I'm going to work with bugs. Yeah, and I went out in the woods and I played with bugs because my stepbrothers and brother and used to like to uh, kind of like torture me. Yeah, and, and whatever. So I went out in the woods and played with bugs, and then it was salamanders. I was really obsessed with bees and spiders and ants, and then um, later on I started keeping fish, and my dad was really supportive of that, and I was breeding some fish, and nice. then um, right about 12 years old, I came to my dad one day and told him my my idea of the most ideal pet would be a boa constrictor. And a boa constrictor at the pet store at Tropic Isle Aquarium was about $79.99. So I bought a boa constrictor, my dad bought it for me, and then I got like two gopher snakes. And then I was really smitten with those and its name was Rodan. <laughs> Later on, that was a male boa constrictor and it was a gorgeous boa constrictor and it was everything. So I, was, I had it at my house and my mother was not too keen on it and so she made me do like this little book report about snakes. So I did my little book report and had to show that I was gonna be responsible. So got the snake. At the same time, my family was a little, my brother got like a little religious okay. and decided that snakes were <laughs> evil. And yeah. it's evil and it eats mice and uh. he's down there and it's whatever. So my brother, basically convinced, convinced my mother to have the snake leave oh, the house. No. So I went to my dad's house, because they were divorced, so I lost my, my snake. And the gopher snakes were over my dad's, and so it was a real, like, I really became obsessed yeah. with snakes at that point, because I had the snake, but I couldn't get to visit with it, except for like maybe every weekend. And there, from there, at the age of 12, I was just catching all sorts of different snakes, always catching garter snakes and stuff like that. And uh, then it became just like my hobby and my obsession, which was fish and reptiles. And uh, ultimately, you know, I, w I went off to school for computers and electronics and whatnot, but ultimately started Nerd in uh, 1994. Oh. And so I defected from a uh, high-tech job, <laughs> senior electronic technician, to, yeah, I think I'm going to breed snakes, <laughs> but I'm going to go to another state where the laws are a little bit lenient. Yeah. So that's what I did, and I started Nerd, and I had no idea what I was doing, but I basically gave myself a six-month plan, which was to, I rented out an area for six months, yep. I paid it up front, I had my collection of snakes, reptiles, which was in a 12 by 22 foot room, and I basically took that collection, moved it to New Hampshire, started building like mad. I basically took a big open uh, basement at a condo, uh, commercial condo where I was renting and I built it out with a foil board and two by fours and built basically a vapor barrier and basically tried to build uh, an area that could hold heat, hold humidity and be semi-tropical because I was very obsessed with a lot of uh, tropical species. And initially at my house I was uh, breeding a lot of colubrids, I did like pine snakes and a lot of uh, different king snakes and some corn snakes. And uh, But I eventually got into breeding boa constrictors, Burmese python and ultimately moving up to New England Reptile to New Hampshire, where I was breeding reticulated pythons, nice. learning how to do all that. And uh, none of this was because I was exactly a proficient uh, python or boa breeder. I was breeding colubrids. I could breed colubrids well enough where um, it started to bore me a little bit, because I was like, wow, I want to keep like these blood pythons and hog island boas and boa, you know, different things like that. And I wanted to breed those, so I just started amassing these animals 
and I was buying and reselling some animals. I was dealing with a fair number of imported animals. And uh, we used to have things like Tom Crutchfield's list. We used yeah. to have things like notes from Noah yeah. and all these different things. And you could put out these ads and like, okay, I have a pair of hog island boas and albino berms, not, maybe not albino berms. Yeah, maybe at that point, maybe albino berms, but all these different things. And you put out these ads that you actually would sell like albino berms and hog island boas and all this different stuff. You get emerald tree boas and you establish them and you would have these ads and then the phone would ring. And then people are calling, like, yeah, I'm calling about the hog on boas. And then you have to go through this thing. And so I, I quickly was, like, uh, you know, very obsessed with my animals. And I love, I love pretty much all animals. I'm really, like, you know, as, as, if you're ever going to meet an animal guy, I'm that guy. I can tell by walking <clears throat> into here because I had no idea until we walked into this building how much stuff you had in here. Even the fish part, hearing you just describe how fish were important to you. Oh, And yeah. the fish section in here. I was blown away. Well, it's, I mean, my fish used to be way more involved, but I kind of like the whole, the brick and mortar store, yeah. we've kind of, you're seeing the, 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 the very low aspect of where it used to be. So I would try to like, I felt like if I was going to send somebody an animal, I want to send like an animal, like the customer would be like me. Yeah. So like when you open up the box, like, wow, this is really good. So I started just like adopting like, you know, New England reptile. I came up with this thing like, any reptile. I'll sell you any reptile. I was trying to be edgy. Well, if I was any reptile and I threw like a D, knowing the reptile sure that would be, the acronym would be nerd and whatever. So Same. I was kind of like that. And at first I was like, what's the name of your company? Nerd. 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 <laughs> what? Any reptiles. And then I eventually just, you know, got yeah. used to it and stuff like that. So it was knowing the reptile and it was like uh, blah, 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 and no junk. See? That was like one of our things. It was like it. no junk. And so I just basically uh, would try to breed animals, sell those, and I also dealt with a fair number of imports, but generally with imports, you have to acclimate, and you have to establish yep. these animals, and also routine worming, setting them up, and actually getting them so they're really, you know, they're doing well, and at that point, they're saleable. But in turn, I felt like you could sell it for more money, because if I'm going through all this effort, and I'm trying yep. to give a, a substantially better animal than you would go and just see as a straight import, you would, uh, you would come back to yeah. me if I sold yeah. you something good. And I've, I basically built my business this whole way. And somewhere along the line, I learned how to breed you know, some of these animals. Yeah, so how hard was that at the beginning for you to sell animals like that? Uh, it was just building uh, a name for yourself yeah. and always being good. And then we started doing like these little shows. And when I would go to shows, I would bring really good stuff because I was putting, I think well, like if you got Amazon tree bows and it was imported Amazon tree, tree bow, you get it in and then you go right through Flagell and Panicure and you set it up and you would start keeping you know, your records and get it so it's feeding well. And then when you brought to a show and you had these, even though they are imports and I wasn't breeding them quite at that point, they were better than other okay. people's. And, and then I would like to, um, my presentation of the animals, yeah. I was always into uh, like displays a certain way. Yeah. And I always had like my own little odd way about it. And I think that was because I'm just so into these animals. I like, I like just like I'm in the other buildings, you know, playing with a, Amazon Basin yep. emerald cages and I'm, I just sit there and I just like to sit there and stare at them and it's been years and years and years I've been doing this but I still my real enjoyment is I get to just sit there and look at my animals and go wow this is still very special to me and that's kind of like what kind of drives me. So I got a question for you since we're talking about starting at uh, some of the venues that you did and you went out to do you remember the first one you ever vended the first reptile expo you would have gone to um that would probably i would say uh timonium down in maryland okay and then we were doing some uh ones in pennsylvania besides like you know the new england herp society because yeah. <clears throat> that was just like a little you know diddly little kind of thing <laughs> but then going down and doing the first maryland shows but I do remember the first time I went down, like I was starting to keep all these different reptiles and like my dream was like green tree pythons because yeah. I was keeping emeralds and green tree pythons was a time where you really couldn't get green tree pythons readily at all. And if you did, they're really good money. They're like 1200 bucks and emeralds were cheaper, but emeralds were a lot more problematic. We didn't quite understand how to keep them yeah. and, and whatnot. And still a lot of people don't understand how to do it now. So I remember getting the first Borneo blood pythons off of Tom Crutchfield, but going down to uh, Orlando yep. as a customer, going down there and I was blown away. That was where I was done. Yeah. As soon as I went down to Orlando, I'm like, 
walking around <laughs> and I'm seeing the likes of Eugene Bissett, uh, yeah. Dave and Tracy Barker, uh, all these, you know, Trooper Walsh, and I'm like, I am nothing. I am like, you know, the, the Bob Clarks, and I'm just walking around, and I'm like, I just have this little collection of steaks. And look at these people. They're like reptile gods, like Eugene Bissett, like Argentine boas, and they're yeah. like pink and gray. And I was totally screwed. At that point, I was like, I'm like obsessed about this, and any, any bit of money I can get, I want better stuff. And then I was looking through Dave and Tracy's... Uh, photo albums, they used to have these flip photos, and oh, you yeah. see the first rack systems yeah. that they were making with like wood and w wire mesh tops, and I'm like looking at that, and there's like amethystine pythons, and I was keeping like amethystine pythons in like three and four foot knee dishes, and they had these other techniques, they were making these uh, <clears throat> wooden cages, and they were using contact paper. Okay. Contact paper doesn't have any pores in it, so when the snake has urates or messes in yep. there, it's very easy to clean. Yeah. I'm like, wow, that was a trick. So I was always trying to figure out different ways to do this stuff. But it basically opened a whole new um, world to me and I became obsessed. And then like seeing Bob Clark, you know, he was doing, uh, we had tiger retics and albino yeah. ball pythons and Pete Call was doing albino boas and all that. And I didn't have any money to buy anything yeah. like that. So, but I was looking and I sat there and I just, like, I just watched these people and somewhere along the line, I was able to somehow figure out how to do all of this without actually having the, the capital, yeah. the money to do it. And the, the only thing that difference was is just my, my understanding of things and working my butt off. Yeah and just being driven to doing all and that. And that's a prime example. I mean, we talk about it in other videos too. If you work that hard for something and you strive to get it, I mean, your story right now is an example to viewers out there. You know, you gotta put the work in. I gotta ask you, the knowledge, is it just from studying up on everything? Because your knowledge of animals, the, the, the way you talk about them, the way they need to be habituated and the care for them and everything is, is next level stuff. Like I, I make it all up. <laughs> I do. It, I didn't. I didn't realize how um, how unique it was because generally, for a long, I'm kind of like a private person. Yeah. So these guys pull that out of me. So they force me to be, and like more now than ever. But I was like just quietly doing this, and generally I like to work by myself and yeah. I, whatever. So I'll always isolate myself. So Rafi Martinez, who, yep. MA Balls, who was like coming in here, and I was doing ball pythons, and he's like. Look at these ball pythons you're making, and he like, I used to put some stuff out on the internet and stuff like that, and then I kind of like, I got distracted, and I kind of just go under a rock periodically. And Rafi came here and he goes, "Can I videotape, whatever?" So I start videotaping, and he's like, "You need like to show people all this different yeah. stuff." And I was like, I wasn't really thinking about it like that. And then I was doing some stuff with monitors, and he's like, "Do you realize like what this you're doing is like you you have this giant thing that can maul you, yeah. and then you're like." Oh, cutie little fish. <laughs> off for the rodent, petting, the thing yeah. is like, goes right after it knowing it's a rodent, but then your hand, it completely acts different. Yep. It's like, you need to show people that. So I first started showing some of my monitors and I got so much hate from people, which was really ridiculous. I put out some stuff and I was showing my friendly monitors yeah. And I just got like the reverse. I got yeah. such negativity yeah. that like, you're, you're, you're playing games and you're doing this and I'm like, what are you people talking about? <laughs> so I was a little bit under a rock and then I got so much, you know, just whatever, but I love that. If yeah. you ever, like, if you, if I do something and then you negate me yeah. or you disregard me, like, now watch me go with it. Yeah. Because anybody in any kind of project, if I get negative energy from people for jealousy or arrogance or whatever, that is all the energy I yeah. need to actually try to own that and, and do better. So I started just doing this. I started uh, Urban Dinosaur, which is, you know, uh, on Facebook. Yeah. Monitor Lizards Urban Dinosaur because I was booted from the main Jeez. monitor groups. And I was ostracized. And my friends who tried to stick up for me, they were ostracized oh. too. So, um, and I just started kind of just exposing like the kind of stuff that I was privately doing. Yeah. And I've gotten better at it because uh, the more I think about it, but it, what really helps is when I have other people that are watching me and, and like, how are you doing it? Because I don't think about that. Yeah. I just, it's like, it's just like me and I, I, I get into things like flowing and all this different stuff. But they make comments and then it gets me to start thinking. And then I'm like, I double up on that and then I try to explain and I'm just going on. But this is all just like in my head. In your head and yeah. I, you know, I just learn like um, if it's a, 
animal outside and I want to make friends with it and I want to learn about it, I learn certain tricks and I've gotten much more fluid at it over the years, but it, it's like I see animals for what I think they are, yeah. not for what I want them to be, and that's a huge problem with reptile keepers. You are not seeing animals for what they are, and myself included, because every day I'm learning more and more about these and the intricate levels of uh, their awareness and that they're able to think and they're able to change their behaviors and discern you and all this different stuff. So as I'm doing this, I'm giving more and more credit to them, which yeah. then perpetuates the whole process. And a lot of reptile people, they're like, oh, isn't it beautiful? Or this and that. And I'm looking at them and I start observing them. Yeah. And I'm like, you don't have this thing that I, I think I have or what I, you go, you're not seeing these animals like I see them. And then I think that little bit of specific variation allows me to be a little bit more gifted in yeah. some ways. But I've been now spreading it and what I really love, and this is like no joke, you know, like the social media stuff is like I do social media because we have to, you know, yeah. you brain yourself, you want to get yourself out there. But I really love is when we do videos on like my ideas, my thoughts and how I do it. And then people are going, wow, I did it and it works. Yeah. And over and over and over again, I love that because it's like, wow, somebody actually is learning and now they can do this little bit of like snake whispering, lizard yeah. whispering, bug whispering, any of that kind of stuff. And I love that yeah. because the more gifted we can be with our animals and the more you get to spread the word, we don't have to, you know, now you're up in Canada, you're talking about a retic. Is yeah. it dangerous and is it this? If you work with these animals, you can take these animals and do wonderful yeah. things with them that bring down people's fear and their just their negative nature. I want to ask you about something because, uh, I mean, a lot of people know this, but tell me a little bit about the cow retics and how that happened because you are the cow retic man, right? On a lot of different <laughs> things. Okay, the we're going to get that too. The cow, but I cow, hear about cow retics. So basically, we started from morphs. So a, a typical cow retic would be an orange ghost stripe, a phantom stripe, and a golden child. Yeah. So we get the, the black. So we started out with all originally imported animals. They came from the wild, just unusual animals that paid a lot of money for, typically. And uh, then you have to breed them and prove the genetics yeah. of them. So those are three morphs that I proved the genetics of, and then just ha happened to breed them together. Uh, was not like a thing like I'm gonna, you know, just make. I think I'm gonna make a, you know, paradox with yeah. this animal. That was a complete surprise to me. <clears throat> At the time, we were already making black-eyed leucistics, which would be super platinums. Yep. And so when we did hatch out, when I hatched out the first blue-eyed leucistics, I was like, oh great, there's another leucistic. I mean, it was like, and I guess in my mind, I'm thinking like, I just want like this crazy pattern, like a really orange snake or whatever, and then I get this white snake. And, but they're beautiful. Yeah. So they're white snake, blue yep. eyes, and they're very, very sweet. And uh, early on, it was like a dot. So I saw like a dot, like a, a little but, bit of paradox. Uh, yeah. So you start raising, and then you're like, okay, this one's got dots, and then all of a sudden you pull it, and you're like, man, this one's got a dot. Like, yeah. <laughs> oh, somebody mixed up the snake. Wow, and then it was just yeah. like, as it started growing, we started getting this really weird you know, look. You also had uh, the white ones with the yellow on them. Yep. And ultimately it made, it's probably one of my uh, proudest achievements of ever, you know, it, it's like literally a calorie tick is anybody that keeps any kind of medium to large Boyd, that is, to, in my opinion, would be a pinnacle animal to keep yep. because they're a lovely temperament, they don't get too big, and they are so dramatic. They're such a great education animal. Yeah. And what's really nice about them is when I present, or Rob presents, or Jeremy, or anybody presents a cow retic to people that are even fearful of snakes, or really, you know, quizzical, or just, I don't, I don't want to touch it. When you bring out a cow, I can bring out a black snake, and oh, I ain't touching oh, yeah. that thing. Yeah. And all of a sudden, I bring out a cow retic, they're like, uh, wow. wow. Yeah. It looks like a Dalmatian. It looks, yeah. and what it does is it brings them down and it's more likely to get them to touch. To touch. And, and the most important thing, as you know, because yeah. you do education, yeah. the, just that immediate touch and all of a sudden, oh, wow. Yeah. It's not like what I thought. And that gets them. And once you touch a reptile or a retake and they have like a positive thing, like it opens up everything, they're, yeah. they're letting down their guard and they're more likely to, I gotta touch this, and you can change people really easily. Absolutely. But a calorie tick is an yeah. incredible steward of 
reptiles in general, so and certainly pythons. Do you know then that KB needs a cow retic from Nerd? <coughs> Just saying, we're going to put that out there. You, you need some sight. Yeah. <laughs> we have to discuss yes, that we, after. We can yes. do that. So another thing that I have to ask you about, because you, we have it at home, you're the guy who basically wrote the book on ball pythons. And I have the book, so I'm very excited about it. Actually, I, I have the four book books, here. But yes. That's all right. So you have four books. So yeah, tell me, tell me how that came to be. Like, where did you decide I need to write about, share this? It was was it the best method of sharing at the time? Is that where the books? Um, I was approached by uh, Bob Ashley, who owns Eco Publishing. He's okay. my publisher, and he says, "Kev, I need you to write the book. You're the guy." Yeah. And uh, it was pretty, mostly to m many people. Like I was at least one of the top tier people that yeah. was doing ball pythons. And I was the one who kind of pretty much came up with all the crazy names, yeah. you know, coming up with spider ball and honeybee and bumblebees and all that. Not things like pie ball, but I came up with the first, you know, pastel, caramel, albino, ghost, spider, super pastel, bumblebee, honeybee, killer bee, all those That's different awesome. things. And I, I come up with all those things and I started out with, you know, imported animals, proved the genetics and yeah. all that. But I wanted to hype things up. So I was making kind of like little goofy names and it was because no one came. Yeah. About ball pythons. They didn't care. So I was like, I can't afford your walnut python, your black headed <laughs> python. I'm going to have this stupid ball python. No. I, I, I yeah. thought the ball python was like the ultimate model for the great pet animal, but I needed to trick it out. Yeah. And so I started doing all that. So I ended up uh, writing the first book, and that was, I was just publishing it when Dimebag Daryl died. Was it? Yeah, it's from Pantera. It's very. Uh, so I was like, uh, yeah, ninety. So uh, so two uh, two thousand six, okay. something like that. Two thousand. I I can't I'll get my. Somebody died. But anyways, it's very. <laughs> but yeah, so I did the first the first book, and we did some morphology in there. Yeah. We did some uh, genetics in there. We did some uh, basic care of, and also going through just you know uh, the 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 animal itself and getting the basics yeah. of that animal and. Um, Wrote that book. We had a simpler version of it, like a pet store guide, and then we did a German version with more stuff added. Wow. And then we did the Ultimate Morph Maker. Yeah. Or, not, not we. It's me. Whatever. You. Yeah. I keep saying that. Yeah. But uh, Eco. Yeah. And uh, and now my publisher is just like any book you write, I will I publish that. it. Yeah. And but the problem is, you know, in the today's day of printed material, like if you went back, like you know, for 10, 12 years ago, it'd be very lucrative. Yeah making these books. Now it's like, you know, Ultimate Ball Python took me about a year to do, and he wants me to do further. Whereas, I, I'm, I'm interested in reticulated pythons, I'm interested in uh, socialization of reptiles, yep. uh, and like, what's what's paramount? I don't really know. Right now, Donnie's got me, we're doing social media stuff, trying to get a pretty good library yeah. of different things and views of our views of these animals and trying to get people so um, they understand these animals a little bit better at least you know when I say better this is all anecdotal it's all in my yeah. eyes yeah. so I do make mistakes I will tweak what I do and I hopefully I'm learning but I, I feel like I can offer some very credible information that is uh, it's a good source. I got another question for you then. I'm going to talk to you about one that I know you love to talk about. Earwigs. Earwigs. So let's talk <laughs> about <laughs> Back to ball python talk for a second here. There's one that I need you to describe for me and that's the spider ball python. Just kidding. Just kidding. <laughs> there I you know go. That's it. Go. We're going to have our viewership's <laughs> just going to go way up. Way spider up. balls. I love spider, spider balls. balls and they're no, no. wonderful. Let me ask you about another one that wonderful. you do that we know nothing about. Odium. Yeah, I don't know anything about it. <laughs> no, odium is uh, is a very interesting thing, and it has a long history, and it's not a clear history within my collection because I was originally the odium came out of the wild. And it was just this two tone weird animal, nothing, nothing of any significance, and it was just happened to be a female, and ultimately bred it with uh, some hidden gene woma stuff, nothing, just produced yeah. some animals, and we raised those animals and bred one of those animals to a Mojave and, and made like this hidden gene woma, Mojave, Enchi, pastel thing. And, and kind of was like making some things. I'm like, okay, this is what a hidden gene woma Mojave was supposed to look like because it was the first yeah. hidden gene woma Mojaves and all that. So made those, they look pretty. And then I didn't know anything until I bred that snake to something else. And I'm like, 
Wow. What is this? Yeah. And then I started looking and you're going on the internet. You're like, how come your snakes don't look like my snakes? And then I started like backtracking. I'm like, wait a minute. Just came back from here. So I backtracked it to this female. But literally, odium. So there is no basic phenotype okay. of like we're going to sit here. This is a normal odium, yeah. like a normal wild type. And this is odium because sometimes you see it, other times you don't. You don't. So, yeah. And this is literally like... We could have something like a het piebald, which you could almost even say that piebald is incomplete dominance because generally a lot of times your hets yeah. have some little indicators, yeah. but you know, it's it's still, it's generally recessive. So odium, on your best case example, your phenotypes, your phenotype is what it looks like. Your genotype is what the genetics that you're ultimately gonna uh, breed that and other different things and cause things to trick out. So I don't really show that because it's, it's not reliable. And I generally don't even regard much of my odium, like single, double G, like a pastel odium, I can sometimes see stuff, but to me, it's not what I'm, I'm doing. But what happens is when you take the odium and then you throw it over combos where we already know what they generally look like, and they look nice, but as we've been doing this for a long time, we, we're getting a little hungry. Yeah. We want some hung we're hungry for variation. Then we basically take the odium to known combos and that causes different things to happen. What it does uh, we get this blurring down the side. We get the totally change of color. It causes uh, flames to go crazy. Yeah. Uh, when you add pastel to it, it can make things that look like, is this a coral glow? Is it have all this different stuff? So what's really wonderful about odium, it is the one gene, I completely don't understand it. And what's great, you take odium and you throw it on a combo that has an epistatic relationship. So when you layer odium on yeah. an epistatic relationship, and you throw it in with epistasis, it can cause all sorts oh, of yeah. really weird things. Huh. And uh, so I, I make this odium stuff, and it is, it's like a, it's a head scratcher. Yeah. It's a, Jeremy certainly has been tortured this year <laughs> with it, because I'm just like, oh, go to it, dude. I'm like, I just make the stuff. Now you can it. like, it is just right from odium or That's whatever. It. Yeah. And it, yeah. it makes all these crazy things, and it's, it is absolutely the wild card, and you can, uh, you know, in a low expression of odium, Nah, it, I can just pair it with a couple yeah. things. It doesn't really look so great. And then I pair it with other things. And yeah. the more genes you add, it goes crazy. Yeah. And there's still a whole bunch of things I haven't done with it. But it's it, it's an exciting gene and it's something I like to kind of almost privatize. I keep to myself. I saw some upstairs, guys. I can't even get close to it. So. Yeah, it's I just, I just, <laughs> I must have them I must all. have them. I got two more questions for you. Uh, I saw you at Tinley. So I know you went back to do an expo are doing Expo something that you might be doing again, like CRBE in Canada? What? CRBE Canada? No. Yes. I, I'll go there to talk. <laughs> I will not bring animals. No, no, but you know what? I would love for you to just come and talk even. They've had me go to Canada before. Yep. I went to Marcus. If you guys want to laugh. Have you ever watched Marcus Jane? I love Marcus Jane. Have yeah. you ever seen yeah. the video where I went out there? No, I didn't. Oh, watch. I'm, I'm going to have to watch. I'm such a oh, wise ass. Harry has. So I went with the, okay. the uh, Python Hunters. And, oh, that's uh, what you were telling me about. So yes. we got, yeah, Python Hunters and myself yeah. got up to, to do uh, one of the Canada shows and yeah. did, did the talk there and bored everybody, I'm sure. <laughs> but then we went to Marcus Jane's place yeah. and uh, and I was obnoxious. And so I'm, guys, make sure I you like catch that obnoxious. video. But it is, it it's is gonna really, be in yeah. The link. Yeah, awesome. but it, yeah, Canada's, uh, it, as far as the people, really, really nice. Yeah. It's too cold. <laughs> you guys don't have any more rattlesnakes anymore? No. And I'm a rattlesnake yeah. freak, um, which is really sad. I'm gonna ask you one more thing, non-reptile related. You sing and play guitar? Yeah. What's the name of the band? Crotalus with the C. Crotalus with the C. So whenever, yes, yeah, so whenever you listen to like our social media, like uh, YouTube, yeah. Whenever you hear the different music, that's that's all that's my guys. bands. Oh. So we have two CDs, and we have like, but my my music's hidden. So I was just <laughs> talking to Jeremy about this, but I'm before long I'm gonna start putting my music out there so people Good. can get it. But I'm a total metal head and uh, very much into like speed metal, thrash metal, technical metal. How long have you been doing that? Um, since I was in high school, I started oh, playing guitar. So I actually time. started. Okay. Yeah, I started late, and, and we have Jeremy, who's like an accomplished musician. So yeah. all whatever I do, like I do this all just like the way I do my <laughs> reptiles. I don't even know what I'm doing, but somehow it works. And then they yeah. go and ask Jeremy, "What am I doing?" And he's like, "Well, you just did a diminished thing with our pedio <laughs> thing and hair and all that." And, he, and he's like, "He's like, yeah, and it really works." And I'm like, "But how do I do this?" And uh, yeah. he's like. 
you just, just do, do it. it. But uh, yeah, I'm total metal head and uh, very That's much awesome. into that. That's awesome. Well, Kevin, thank you for your time. I know we yes. took up a lot of it today. I appreciate it. Uh, we want to come back. Guys, make sure if you're following us and you're not following Kevin, it's shameful. The link will be in the description down below. Make sure you go over, give him a follow. Donnie does awesome work. Jeremy's a great guy. The whole staff here is amazing. Kevin, I mean, we could talk for hours. Full of so much knowledge, amazing animals. Come down, check out Nerd. Make sure you get on their wish list and check out stuff and order stuff and get it. You're getting it from an accomplished guy, guys. Thank you again, Kevin. Thank you. See you guys. Bye, guys.